Welcome to Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and Friends. The only podcast where it's okay to talk in band. On this podcast, you will be able to hear conversations with some of the greatest names in wind band conducting, composing, and arranging. We'll also visit with great college, high school, middle school, and elementary band directors to get their thoughts on various aspects of being a band director. We'll have regular check-ins with instrument specialists, music dealers, and instrument repair professionals. And if that's not enough, we'll even have regular conversations with Dr. Tim, who will help keep us motivated. That's Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and Friends. And now, here's Charlie. Welcome to Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and Friends, and this, our 19th podcast in the series. We're sure having a lot of fun with this series, and I hope you're enjoying listening as well. We got two great conversations for you today. And you know, everything's changing, everything's going upside down, and it's going to be really fun and refreshing to just hear from a couple of band directors, a couple of guys who have been there and who have done that, and just had some incredible programs and incredible successes along the way. We're going to begin with Stan Schoonover. Stan was at Mount Vernon High School in Virginia, went to Robinson High School in Virginia in the Fairfax County area, became supervisor of music in Fairfax County, and he's going to share some wonderful insights that he has about what we're we're looking at uh, with this fall and the coronavirus and opening schools. Uh, our second interview today is going to be with Bob Buckner. Bob was a great school band director in Silva Webster, North Carolina, and he's got a great story to tell. He even taught in a school bus. You're going to hear all about it. And then he had incredible success in the marching band world. But I got to tell you, I've known Bob a long time, and he's just one fine band director. It's a great conversation. I hope you're going to enjoy it. We welcome you to Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and Friends. We'll be right back with Stan Schoonover. Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and Friends is made possible through the support of Hal Leonard, Eastman Musical Instruments, and Vandercook College of Music. Well, it seems like 100 years ago when I was uh, judging a band competition in Florida. I have been on a panel of judges and we had flown all night from uh, El Paso, Texas to uh, Fort Lauderdale. We were doing a band competition down there and uh, uh, it was going okay and then all of a sudden this incredible band comes on the field from Mount Vernon, Virginia. Mount Vernon High School in Fairfax County, Virginia and they were unbelievable and our next guest is the guy that directed that band way back then. And uh, since that time, we've become just great friends and we've hung out together on too many occasions and we've played a lot of golf and we've judged a lot of band festivals. And it's just an honor to have my buddy Stan Schoonover on the podcast. Stan, welcome. Thanks, Charlie. How are you? Man, I'm doing good. So, so Stan, let's get off the most important question right off the bat, because I'm sure our listeners want to know, how's your golf game? Well, I hate to say it, but, you know, it's in the tank. <laughs> <laughs> Although it's been great because it's been one of the only things we can do uh, during, you know, March, April, May, and June. So it's been a blessing to be able to go outside and play. So, okay, so we'll keep the interview short because I know you're probably heading to the driving range this morning and then you got a big tea time. So, uh, yeah, okay. Well, Stan... Uh, for the folks that don't know you or haven't heard about you, and I don't know, they must have been under a rock for the last 50 years, but give us a quick rundown on your career and where you grew up, went to college, and and your, your jobs that you had. Sure. Well, um, I grew up in the Poconos in uh, northeastern Pennsylvania, uh, went to East Stroudsburg High School, had three great role models. Uh, at that point, you know, uh, Clem Wiedenmeyer, my elementary band director, uh, John Casagrande, my high school band director, and then Bob Zellner, who is my director at Gettysburg College. 
So I did my bachelor's at Gettysburg College. And uh, during the next three or four years while I was teaching, I finished my master's at Westchester. Wow. And then, but then, so then your, your teaching career, you started where? At Mount Vernon? Teaching career, I, I did uh, as uh, a lot of folks uh, do. I started uh, at, for a year as an elementary band director uh, in Gettysburg. That was a leave of absence job I was filling. And then I got hired in a little um, school system close to home, uh, Bangor, Pennsylvania. And I taught in Bangor for four years. And then uh, I moved to Mount Vernon in Fairfax County. I taught at Mount Vernon for 10 years and West Springfield and Robinson for six. And then I went into the um, office as the music supervisor for Fairfax County. Well, you had great bands at Mount Vernon and Robinson. <clears throat> and then you followed uh, uh, the legendary Mo Turrentine as music uh, chairman for the Fairfax County Schools. So uh, what was the scope of your work when you were when you were chairman and how many schools and how many staff members were you responsible for? Uh, Fairfax County is a pretty big place. So there were um, um, 147 schools at the time. And uh, we had uh, in the music uh, staff, we had over 500, close to 600 music teachers in the system. And my, my job was to oversee the entire program. I had help in the office with um, some of the other disciplines. I was primarily responsible for taking care of the instrumental music program, but music overall. And, um, you know, making sure that the biggest part of my job from a, just a, a work standpoint was each spring and summer, I had to schedule elementary band and string teachers in 147 buildings. So that was quite, quite a task. It, it took quite a while, but uh, that and you know, overall budget for the system, buying equipment uh, and interviewing uh, prospective employees. So what was the most difficult part of that job? I think the most difficult, if you want to call it that, which uh, and sort of frustrating part, was uh, to just make sure that everybody was always aware of what a great music program we had and, and doing everything I could and everything we could in the office to increase and protect that program. Yeah, the Fairfax County uh, District is legendary. I mean, those are some of the greatest bands uh, in the nation that, that are there. And they're still really terrific bands uh, in that part of the country and for the whole country as a whole. So when you think of the staff that you worked with over the years, Stan, what are some of the characteristics that stood out that made those teachers really great? Well, you know, it's odd because, you know, um, there, there are a lot of different successful teaching personalities. Uh, I had the John Casagrandes and the Jeff Bianchis and the Carl Blyes, and they're all very different. But I think that first and foremost, um, it's a passion for music and for teaching music. That is the most important thing, the most important characteristic for anyone to have. I mean, certainly uh, work ethic is important, but basically having a passion about music and then a passion for teaching kids. And what was the most frustrating part about dealing with some of those teachers? Uh, when um, I had to, call their administration and defend them for a few things that they might have <laughs> gone a little over the line about. <laughs> a little a little too passionate sometimes. Ah, well, we've all been there too, haven't we? <laughs> yeah. So, so since you retired from your uh, supervisory position in Fairfax, and I'm not sure how many years that's been, was it six or seven right now? 11 now. 11? Time flies when you're having fun. Man, you're a lot older than you look then, I'll tell you. <laughs> Uh, 11 years. So uh, you've been really busy still as a clinician and an adjudicator. Uh, any thoughts on how teaching band or being a band director has changed from the days when you first started? Uh, William D. Ravelli used to say, um, bands are still bands and good teaching is still good teaching. Having, having said that, uh, the situation is is different 
today. I mean, my last year actively in the classroom, I hate to say, was 1998. So it's been a long time since I've been in the day-to-day -day job of teaching music. And uh, attitudes, student attitudes and adult attitudes are different than uh, they were back in the late 1990s. So I, I think it's a little more demanding today in terms of um, how you have to prepare and present your program and justify uh, your decisions. I mean, there's a lot more scrutiny that goes on in the world of education now than there was uh, 20 some years ago. So I know you conduct the Fairfax County Winds, which is a community band in the DC area. Uh, what's the history of that group? So when I went into the office to become the, the music supervisor, it immediately became apparent to me that I no longer had anything to do artistically. I was, I was now an administrator. And so about halfway through my first year, I pitched an idea to my boss saying, I want to start a, uh, a teacher's band so that we can meet and talk about issues and talk about teaching and talk about music and talk about how to rehearse. And so I started that band in December of uh, 1999. It took a year to get things sort of off the ground. And actually, uh, Mo Turrentine, who you mentioned early on, was really helpful in, in helping to convince my boss that this was a good idea. So we started the band, and it became um, a class in the Fairfax County Public Schools Academy. Teachers can could sign up free of charge to take this class and get recertification points and non-college credit if they wanted it uh, for playing in the ensemble. So it was a it was great for me and I think it was great for teachers. So we just hit year uh, 21 uh, with that group and we're now uh, private. It's a 501c3 group now. Uh, I'm not teaching classes anymore, but that's how it began. And, and uh, we've had a great run. We've had a lot of fun. And you were selected to perform at the 2020 Midwest Clinic. Congratulations. And that has now been canceled. <laughs> so congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what were your thoughts prior to the time you learned the clinic was canceled? I mean, you know, the COVID-19 crisis, I mean, Chicago's having some issues all on its own. What was going through your mind before you got word that uh, it wasn't going to happen this year? Well, um, so the, the, we met, the last time I met the band was on March 1st, which is when we made our recording and, and submitted it. And literally two weeks later, uh, I'm in, in Indianapolis for the Music for All National Festival, which I, which I coordinate. And, you know, we get one night in and the next, the next day, the whole world just stopped. So, I mean, but in, within two weeks from the time uh, we made that recording with my community band from Midwest and, and 14 days later, you know, all, all bets off. I mean, it's, 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 you know, just a really scary time and it's still pretty scary, Charlie, as you know, I mean, here in Northern Virginia, we're not, we're not necessarily a hotspot anymore, but we're, we're pretty far behind some of the other parts in the country and how open we are for things. So I was really I was really sort of on pins and needles, uh, you, know, you know, having taken the Vandercook band so many times to Midwest, uh, how hard it is to pick music and how hard it is to get a program put together uh, with all the restrictions and requirements that the clinic has for that. So there are hours and hours and hours of, of planning that had already gone in with no clue whether the event was going to happen or not. And, and in reality, I think it's the exactly the right call. I, there's just no way you can get 10,000 people <laughs> together and, and possibly be safe. So I think everybody made the right decision. So, you know, we heard of groups like, uh, you know, New York Philharmonic has canceled all of their things through the rest of 2020 and things like that. Uh, any idea when your community band can get back together and start rehearsing and any thoughts about how you do that in this age of social distancing? Well, I'm looking for a parking lot and everybody brings their lawn chair, <laughs> and their music stand. We sit outside and, you know, uh, sit six feet apart and have at it. <laughs> and a boatload of clothespins, right? <laughs> right. 
it, it, uh, it, uh, we laugh, we joke, but um, I don't know when we're going to be able to get back inside someplace to rehearse. I mean, it's just uh, our schools right now are struggling with um, our public schools in Fairfax County have floated a two prong proposal. They're proposing either no on site education in the fall or uh, a kind of a every other day schedule so that every student would go to school two days a week and be at home three days a week. And um, with that and no, you know, George Mason University, the Center for the Arts has canceled all their performances through December 2020. The Kennedy Center is closed through December 2020. So um, it's a challenge right now to, to uh, find any way to, you know, rehearse and, and play. Yeah. Those every other day things, you know, the two days on and two days at school and the rest distance, I'm sure that's there to, to limit class sizes and to limit the number of students that are in classrooms, correct? Exactly right. And, and, and primarily, as we all know about public school systems, when you reach a certain size, it's all about lunch and transportation. <laughs> <laughs> getting, getting everybody to the school and getting them home and, and the, the restrictions on buses are the the 50 some 70 passenger buses are only going to be able to transport about 20 kids so getting kids to school you can't get everybody there every day uh safely so and then just getting them in the building uh, taking their temperature every day before they come in i mean there's just a myriad of things and cleaning the buildings every day and every night um it's just a whole new world of what normal is going to be so, so you got your administrator hat on right now, and I, I love it. So let's let's continue yeah. down this path a little bit. You know, in your previous role and, and the decision to cancel the Midwest Clinic, but we got a lot of directors out there that are facing the fall and marching band and starting beginners and all that sort of stuff. What questions should those directors be asking themselves as they start looking for the new year? First and foremost, uh, for everybody concerned, the faculty, the, the staff, the students, um, how can we be safe? I mean, how, how can we provide the best uh, environment for being able to have some kind of face-to-face -face education and still be safe? And, and, you know, there are tons of studies being done right now about playing instruments that seem to lead us to think that playing an instrument might actually be better in terms of how close together you can sit because the instrument seems to mitigate most of the aerosol spray out but you know you still got all the the, the water you know keys that you got to deal with on brass instruments and where that all goes but you got to be safe and then and then um we've always been i think in our profession a pretty creative bunch so finding outlets you know you're not going to meet all 50 or 60 of your students in an ensemble ever uh, unless, again, you can go outside and just stand there and, and play. So you're going to have to find ways. Uh, years ago, you had a great chamber music program in your high school. Uh, and I think that's going to be the, the, the way things are going to have to start out here in the fall um, is to just find, you know, music to play with groups of, you know, less than 20 kids. So if you were doing high school, let's back to your days in Mount Vernon and Robinson, would you be planning on marching in the fall? No. <laughs> and and I, let's get this straight. I mean, I um, I really value marching band. Right. And, and what it can do uh, both musically, if done correctly, and socially for kids and, you know, for the community. So I, I am very pro marching band, but I just don't, I, you know, how do you, and it's very physical activity. You know, and, and so that does when you're that physically active and you're using that kind of air and and, and breathing and so on, you, you're going to have to be even farther apart than than you you are normally. So um, I just think that is going to create a real issue. And and it, it looks to me like at least in our immediate area, we're not even sure there'll be any contact sports at all in the fall. So, you know, other than golf. <laughs> and maybe cross country and uh you know uh that tennis uh that make those may be the only kind of sports we can uh, offer in the fall and, and so and that marching band would go right along with that and and since if there's not going to 
if you're not going to be allowed to travel because you can't get on a bus uh, and be safe, uh, it's going to be a real challenge to have any kind of you know competitive marching game. Yeah, I think that's I think that's pretty good advice. I think you're I think you're right on the mark there. So let's let's go back. We've all got great stories from our early days of teaching. We some of them we want to share and some of them we don't. But uh, we can la- look back and laugh on them today. But at that moment. I mean, they were incredible crises. You know, some of these young teachers, probably in their first year of teaching, and they're going like, my God, the COVID virus hit, and I had to do virtual teaching at home, and my gosh. And tw- hopefully 20 years from now, they can look back and laugh at this and go, can you believe we had to, had to do that? So, so you got any stories from your early days of teaching you can share? Uh, I have way too many uh, <laughs> that, that we have time for. Uh, so Bangor, Pennsylvania. Uh, was a really interesting place. Um, it was a combination of a heritage of Welsh folks and, a, and Italian folks that were kind of put into the same community school. And, and I, I got hired by the superintendent. Uh, and when I went to the school to find my schedule, I, there was no band during the school day. Band was all after school. So there was, it was like, you know, come if you want to come, don't come if you don't want to come. And the school itself was 10 to 12, but my marching band used 8th and 9th graders and 10th through 12th graders. And the 8th and 9th graders used to get bussed up after school so they could come to marching band practice. Thank, thank goodness um, I, I could work my way through. So that was my first year. My first chair trumpet was also my first chair horn. He did not read music. My drum major, who who was a senior, uh, did not play an instrument and did not read music. Um, and I mean, it, it was it was one of those places where music was in the community because I joined the Elks uh, when I got to Bangor, Pennsylvania, because they did a variety show every year with about fifty male singers that were, was just incredible. So. The, the town had that uh, musical heritage, but the school, the high school did not. So, you know, fast, fast forward four years later, uh, when my career there was finished, we had band every day. And I was also the choir teacher, choir three times a week. I taught the jazz band. I taught music theory. Uh, I taught guitar and I had rotating small group pullout lessons uh, every day <laughs> so that we, you know, we, we kind of went from, uh, zero to, you know, a hundred percent in four years. And that, that was very gratifying, but it was scary, you know, to start out that way. And it just, it reminded me immediately of what Bob Zellner told us in college. He said, go out and get the worst job you can find to take the worst job you can find and make all the mistakes you want. Cause nobody's going to know. He said, and, and that's how you learn and grow as a teacher. So I, I guess part of that, you know, would be exactly what I would offer to a young teacher today. Uh, you know, don't don't run away from problems. You know, solve them because it's going to help you become a better teacher. So you look back at life, make a lot of decisions along the way. Any decisions you'd do over? Uh, well, certainly I'd try to become a professional golfer if that had been. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, so when I was a a high school senior, I had a science teacher and my he offered both me and my best friend, Bruce, um, full scholarships to Rensselaer uh, to major in science. And my best friend, Bruce, said, absolutely, I'll do that. You know, and and he was like, cool. And Stan, I said, no, I'm going to be a high school band director. (laughs) He just kind of looked at me like what? <laughs> I said, that's what I want to do. It's what I've wanted to do since I was eight years old. I mean, I knew, I knew early on that, that, uh, what I wanted to do with my life. And so, uh, I, I have, I have no regrets, uh, uh, about it. I mean, I've, I've experienced so many great things, um, through that whole process and wouldn't trade it for the world. You made a great decision back then and you've influenced a lot of lives, and I happen to be one of them that you've influenced. You've been a great friend, a dear friend. 
I always enjoy time with you, Stan, and uh, I can't wait to get on the golf course, but you're going to have to give me strokes. Okay, buddy? <laughs> well, I might give myself a stroke, but that's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and the way I hit the ball, we will definitely practice social distancing without even trying, so there you go. <laughs> Stan, thanks for being on the podcast. Thanks, Charlie. I enjoyed it. Stan Schoonover, he is a good one. He is one fine teacher and one fine human being. And I love the quote he shared from William D. Ravelli, that bands are still bands, and great teaching is still great teaching. It's never been more true than it is today. And we need great teachers in our classrooms. We need teachers ready to meet the challenges that they're going to face this fall. We don't know what they're going to be, but we know they're going to be there. And I just hope that you're ready for it. We're going to be back with Bob Buckner right after this. Today's podcast is made possible through the support of Hal Leonard, publisher of the Essential Elements Method for Band and the Essential Elements Interactive website that is free for Essential Elements users. Essential Elements Interactive, or EEI, is a state-of-the-art cloud-based support program that is constantly evolving to provide you and your students with more information and resources to help them learn and have fun while doing so. To learn more about EEI, visit EssentialElementsInteractive.com. You know, one of the great things about having your own podcast is that you get to invite the people you really want and love. And man, I've been having so much fun with this. And today is no exception. Uh, had a chance to meet this guy, I think 40 years ago or something like that, when we uh, crossed paths at the Bands of America Summer Symposium in Whitewater, Wisconsin. And it was like uh, an instant connection. And we both left, I think, at the end of the week with our ribs hurting from laughing so damn hard. Uh, but he has remained a dear friend. And I have so much respect for him as, he, as a person, uh, as a musician, as a teacher. Um, he's one of the real great people in our profession. I want to welcome my buddy, Bob Buckner, to the podcast. Bob, welcome. Well, thank you, Charlie. <laughs> Appreciate you going out on a limb to do this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you're a slam dunk. I'm not worried about that. You know, I was thinking back, as I just said, we passed our 40th anniversary of meeting each other. And I think it was, what, June of 1980. Um I was on the staff at Bands of America at Whitewater, and you were a Bands of America clinician that was working with a lab band. I mean, the whole marching thing was really in transition, and you were working with a lab band. It was an upstart band. I mean, they were just scuffling, and and the director was a young guy who uh, had a bright future, and everybody knew it, Um, and they've turned into making quite a name for themselves. I mean, you helped Marion Catholic High School and their director, Greg Bim, that summer. And, and that's how we met. And I know you were a lot younger then. You remember that? <laughs> yes, I do remember that. And, I, you know, when Tim Lotzenheiser came up with the idea to do a lab band, um, he suggested this man, Kathleen. Of course, I had no idea who that would be. I, I went up to Chicago to visit with them and was just blown away, first of all, with Greg. But then when the, the band got to Whitewater, they were so totally prepared. They knew all their music. They had everything memorized. Um, the students were phenomenally well trained and behaved and focused. And geez, I thought every band was going to be like that. <laughs> so uh, they weren't, to say the least. But uh, although we had some really good bands that, that came through that program. And uh, for that time, I thought it was a really innovative program. And, it, and Greg Bim is still... Uh, a dear friend. Matter of fact, we were doing some texting yesterday. So uh, yeah, great, great experience for me, probably better for me and my staff. That's also the week I met uh, LJ Hancock. He actually worked on our, uh, on our staff that week uh, as a volunteer. He was paying to go to camp and working with the band. So yeah, pretty much fun. Those were the days. Yeah. And you're, you're right. I mean, Greg Bim is one of the greats in our profession and He's one of those guys that's been an incredible innovator and he is always so eager to learn and is one of the most uh, supportive people I've ever met. I've seen him work with younger directors and give advice and counsel and uh, Greg, Greg's great. Uh, I love him to death. So Bob, uh, you had a pretty meteoric rise to fame, you know, uh, not many people knew who Bob Buckner was. And then in 1979, you brought this little 
banned from uh, Silva Webster High School in North Carolina to Whitewater and, and stole the show. In fact, I was talking with Tim Lotzenheiser about this yesterday, and he said, oh, I remember that. He said, he said, it was, he said at the finals, and they were announcing the results, he said, your kids, your kids were going like, I think they forgot about us. I think they forgot about us. And then, and then all of a sudden, you're crowned the, the, the national champ. So uh, uh, we're going to get to that a little bit later about, about your, your time at Silva and going to Bands of America. But I, wanna, I want people to know a little bit more about Bob Buckner, the band director, and, and not Bob Buckner, the marching band director. So, so tell us your story about, you know, you played tuba. What made you get in the band directing business? Well, um, I guess I should start with learning to play tuba. I actually started band late. I was like a semester and a half late getting into band. But uh, long story short, they needed a bass drummer for the Canton Labor Day Parade. And they recruited me to come in because they had two uh, girls in the in the uh, percussion section. Neither one of them wanted to play bass drum in the parade. So I was recruited. So I did that for about oh, six months. A fellow named Charles Isley uh, actually started me um, on percussion. Um, and about before Christmas, maybe a little right after Christmas, the junior high band director came in and said, look, we're we don't have a tuba player. Well, before he finished, I had my hand up, um, that I wanted, I just wanted to, I wanted to play something different. I was, I just could see that I was going to be kind of confined in how much, uh, I was going to be able to do. So they had a fortunate, an all state tuba player, uh, who was doing at that time, you know, you could do study halls and he took me in the practice room and for, Two and a half weeks, we worked on uh, teaching me tuba. He taught me, first thing he did was teach me how to breathe, uh, which when you think about that, that's probably the key to brass playing period. Well, in two weeks, he said, you're you're ready to be in the band. So I come out and I'm like, really? He's like, oh yeah, you can play with those guys. So we sit down and I'll never forget, we were playing this little arrangement of Great Gate of Kiev. And when the band started, I started playing. And we finished about, you know, two or three phrases. And when we stopped, the entire band turned around and looked at me. And it was like a moment I'll never forget. I, I get cold chills thinking about it. I, I realized I had found a place. You know, I'd found something that really meant something to me. And it and I was so consumed with all that sound around me. So it was it was really a a, a fun thing to to have happen. Um I had a great high school band director, um, actually two that followed, uh, Aaron Hyatt, who I ended up following to Western Carolina years later, and then uh, Jim Crocker, and both were terrific mentors to me. Both are deceased now. But um, I told Jim after my freshman year in high school, I said, I want to be, I think I want to be a band director. And he said, well, Bobby, I've got three years to talk you out of that. And he said, if you still want to do it, he said, I'll support you. So I did all the things. I, he drove me to camps. We would drive to East Carolina University, which was at that time was about a seven and a half, eight hour drive. So I could go to camps in the summer. I went to several band camps. And I just came back from each one just more and more enthused and more excited about it. So then he, uh, you know, I, I decided that I would go to Western Carolina because Aaron Hyde offered me a $50 a quarter um, scholarship. <laughs> and my sister, my sister and I were the first two in our family to go on to higher education. And my dad always told me, he said, you do whatever you want to, but he said, do something that's going to give you a career and not a job. And he explained the difference. He said, you know, that'll give you the opportunity to make some of your own decisions about what you want to do. Gosh, what good advice that was. So I followed Aaron to, to Western Carolina um, for my $50 uh, quarter. Uh, and we were on three quarter system. Uh, but for that, I was able to uh, um, be the uniform manager, uh, the equipment manager and the librarian. And little did I know that that was the foundation of my band directing career because I learned how to handle the logistics of the band. And it was a, it was a tremendous opportunity for me and, and one that I've sort of filed away 
never thinking I would be a college band director, but I filed away the leadership aspect of that. Plus the important thing was, if, as you know, if you're, you know, it, you have keys. And uh, so I was able to access the building. I could get in after hours to practice and I could, uh, I could actually, I think the statute of limitations is up on all that now, but uh, <laughs> I, I spent a lot of time uh, in the building able to, uh, you know, to sort of stretch my days out. So that's kind of how I got into it. And was Silva your first job? Uh, yes. Um, I, in the summers, I was working uh, at a place called Deco Corporation in Hazelwood, North Carolina. And they were um, actually where I live now. I live about a mile from there. And what I was doing was really hard work. They made radiator hose. They made mattresses, a lot of foam rubber products. Um, V belts for automobiles, things like that. It was really hard work. And I got a call in August of that year. And it was from my dad came over from the, the maintenance shop where he was the, in charge of maintenance and said, uh, you've got a phone call you need to return. So when I called, it was Aaron Hyatt. And he said, I've got a job I want you to take. And I'm like, well, I've got to, I've got to finish school. And he said, no, you need to take this job and we'll work out the school. So long story short, I go to meet with the principal, a man named Carr Hooper, to whom I will forever be indebted. Uh, interesting guy, spent the Second World War in a Japanese prison camp. So he was, discipline was not an issue at our school, but um, he, he interviewed me. And that was in the time when you, this was small rural community and you could not find enough band directors to, you know, to do the work. And he hired me. So I went to school full time and taught in seven schools at the same time and made the dean's list, uh, which was probably the second time I made the dean's list after I got there because I was uh, just so focused. And I, I, you know, at that point, it all became really real to me that I that all this stuff I was learning in class, I was really going to need. So uh, I remember, I do remember that my salary the first year because I was part-time was $250 a month. Um, and they gave me $50 for gas. And I gave that to my dad because I was driving his car. I didn't even own a car at the time. So it was, uh, you know, it was quite a start, but absolutely the best thing that ever happened to me. If I, you know, if I was teaching a class and I taught, as I said, I taught seven schools six of them were grades one through eight um i never had a band room in any of those schools until a bit later but uh, what i would do is i would go in and you know i carry every, all my supplies in my car um before you text you know would text and drive you would write notes and drive <laughs> at least that's what i did so i was constantly trying to keep myself organized and keep keep stuff going the way it was supposed to go and if I didn't know how to do something, if I if I had a question about clarinet on, but sure, I just I just go back to school and I go find the clarinet teacher. And said, look, you got to teach me this. You know, you got to show me how to do this. You got to explain this. So all the pedagogy really kind of came to life for me, and I think that was the place where uh, that started to make sense to me. You know, is is like you got to get kids to understand how to make a good sound. Um, how to learn the different skills they need, you know, the articulations, how to, you know, how to play the instrument. And so it was a terrific opportunity. Plus, um, you know, I had, I had the opportunity to meet teachers in the school, being in schools like that, you know, basically there might be one sixth grade class. So I made sure I knew all the fifth and sixth grade teachers and I would take them coffee and say, look, tell me who your sharp kids are. And, and they would help recruit for me because after I was there for a while, they realized that number one, I was going to show up every day. And number two, uh, the kids were going to be uh, challenged and, and most of them became pretty successful. But I mean, even in that program, and this was a county of 20,000 people. But he, and so you can imagine how small the school system was. We were still recruiting 110 to 120 beginners every year. Um, because kids, they basically want something good. You know, they want to be a part of something good. And so that was, that was a great, uh, opportunity for me. So I understand that in your early days, you even taught school in a school bus. 
Well, somewhere along the way, maybe 72, 73, somewhere in there, we got the idea. We just had this, we had no opportunity to uh, have our own band room. So in North Carolina, they would retire school buses after every so many years. They'd just take them out of service. And, um, and I had a great superintendent, and I convinced him that maybe it was a good thing for us to take one of those and remodel it. So my assistant director at the time, a guy named Mike Troll, who was a you know very innovative, uh, hardworking guy, and he, so we decided that we took all the seats out, we carpeted the floor, we installed 220 heat, and he painted the inside. He spray painted it. I'm sure OSHA would not appreciate the way he went about it, but we had this great little room and we carried, you know, we would carry maybe a dozen folding chairs. We had to tie everything down. We had a little repair station. We would ca carry a tuba. We would carry French horn, the euphonium, so that the kids didn't have to carry those to school. So, um, and we taught in that until I think he finally blew the engine in it and uh, we just didn't have the funds to you know, to, to replace it. But so you were driving that, the school bus from school to school? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if, you know, if you want to teach band, you have to do what you have to do. So that was what we had to do. Oh man, that's awesome. Well, I mentioned earlier, you know, you won the Bands of America Summer Nationals in Whitewater uh, in 1979. So talk about that experience, getting the kids prepared, going to Whitewater. What are you expected? The results give us a give us a, 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 a trip down memory lane on that one. Oh, uh, you know, every time I start thinking about that, I uh, you know sort of have a different train of thought. But sort of where I am is with it is it's probably one of the most remarkable experiences ever. By that time, by the mid to late seventies, uh, actually early seventies, we had a good band program. Um, you know, I always thought if you stayed in one place at least six years, so you got your kids, you know, your beginners and all those people in the program, you started to realize if you were a good teacher and where your weak areas were. And, and there were two of us, fortunately, and we were able to discuss that and build a curriculum. Steve Troll, who's now with the Molin Uniform, Steve uh, was my assistant for a year and he helped me develop a really nice curriculum so the kids could play. Um, you know, you, I, I appreciate the fact in the intro that you talked about me as a band director, not just a marching band director, because particularly during that time, you were labeled one or the other. Well, if, if it's a good marching band, they certainly can't play and, um, and vice versa. And of course, now all that's changed. Uh, you know, if you want to win a marching band contest, you better be able to play to even have a chance to start with. And, and in reality, I felt like we were like that all along. We never had the depth of talent um, that you would see in some of these great bands today because we had 800 students. The band we took to Whitewater had 30 kids who were seventh and eighth graders. So now that would include some guard people and percussionists, but I mean, that was what was remarkable about it. We had, uh, I think we did the whole trip for about $12,000. We had a, a parent who loaned us a, or he drove a, a tractor trailer. We hung our signs on it. So everybody thought we owned our own tractor trailer and he never told anybody any different. And, he, and so it was kind of fun that we looked like we were this really big deal, but we weren't. We spent the night in Ben Davis uh, High School in Indianapolis on the way up and um, rehearsed there. Ray Cox was the band director at that point. We went on up to Hayworth and we're entered in a contest, you know, sort of to get our feet wet because we had prepared the band and had really refined our show uh, that spring. We had, I had a lot of really great input from the people who had judged our show that spring. Bruce Burrett was down, uh, Freddie Martin was in. Um, I had Michael Coomer was, uh, was working with our percussion at that point. So we, we got together with our staff and really sort of refined the show and got it to where we wanted it to be. But nobody had really seen it but us. We thought it was pretty good, but we didn't really know. And and I, I was so shocked that we won the Hayworth show. And that, by the way, was the second time I'd ever met Ken Snook. And he was standing behind me at the steps of the press box and made the comment to me, he said, you're going to win this show. And I was like, 
really? <laughs> He's like, oh, yeah, really? So, and I learned that Ken always deals in the truth. So uh, he was absolutely correct. So we, my thought going into this was that we could be competitive in the lower class, class A. I had seen the Hanover band from Pennsylvania. They were wonderful. Um, I thought they were going to be the, the, the big competition in that class. Although Monticello was in that, um, Illinois is a really, really fine band. And actually that whole show, that was a wonderful show. Tate was in that, um, live, not live Oak, but, uh, Independence High School from California, Falls Church, Virginia. I mean, you go on and on that list for years and years. That was one of the best band shows I'd ever seen. So at any rate, um, we get to Whitewater, we're staying in the dorms, um, which was wonderful for the bands because you could, that's why we could do this so inexpensively because we did everything to cut corners. Our first meal when we traveled was always a picnic. We just tell the kids bring, bring a picnic and we'll find a rest here and we'd stop and spread out at the picnic tables. And that's where we would eat our first meal just to save money. So when we, we got to Chicago on the way up, stopped and, did hit this, you know, all the scenic things had to took the kids to the Sears tower, a couple of museums, but I'll never forget in the Sears tower. Some of the kids called the local radio station and, uh, and they were, and of course the announcer was friend and everybody in town knew we were going on the trip. And, and they were like, if you'll step outside and wave, we think we can see you from here. I mean, it's, <laughs> this is the most naive group of kids you can ever imagine but they were hard workers and they were hardcore and, and they had, you know, they had prepared themselves. So we get into whitewater. I love that atmosphere. Bands were everywhere. They were practicing all over the grounds. Um, you know, you had people walking around just watching bands rehearse. Uh, you had this excitement in this wonderful camp that Larry McCormick had, uh, had been, you know, he had visualized and put together. It was just such a, a magic place. Um, and then we go into prelims and I think there were probably maybe 35 to 40 bands. There were, I know it was, there was a good band show and that was only about the fourth year maybe. Um, so we go into prelims and I'm thinking, boy, if we can just make finals. And I don't know if you remember, but at that time they had a sign and it was a leaderboard and they would put it down at the right hand right of the press box and it showed who the top 12 were not in any particular order and not with scores but you kind of knew where you stood so I noticed as the day went on we were watching we had performed we watched the prelims that our band just kept getting closer and closer because our goal was really let's just make finals and as it turned out we made finals um, we go into the band directors meeting um, and they have us draw for position. And so I, I drew number one, <laughs> we're going on first. <laughs> so, and my thought was, well, I have ruined this for this band. And I remember telling my drum major and she said, oh, it doesn't matter when we go on. She said, we're gonna, we're gonna do great. And she said, that's what you've always told us is, you know, just do your best and don't worry about the rest of it. Have fun in the program. So. I sort of relaxed and the next day we went on one. I remember it was daylight, you know, when we went on, I think maybe they had turned the lights on. We gave a terrific show, not a, not a perfect show. I actually thought our prelim show was a little bit better. Um, but as the night went on, I honestly didn't think I saw anybody that had a better package. I thought there were a couple of bands that maybe played a little bit better than we did. Although we ended up being, you know, very competitive in, in every caption. I think we won two, two captions. So it was, uh, and then they announced the awards. And as you said, the band thought that they had been forgotten. Um, we end up, you know, I, I, what I remember is that someone had a tape recorder in the dorm and they had recorded, a parent had recorded the announcement. And it said, and now the 1979 Grand National Champion, Silver Webster High School. Well, in the dorm that night, every, somebody kept playing that over and over. 
And every time they would make that announcement, that every kid in the band would start cheering. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it was, it was like, it was really, it, it, uh, you know, some magical kind of fun things. Uh, the Hanover band actually stayed in the dorm with us and Charlie Brody and, and Colleen, uh, they have been dear friends ever since I ended up writing for, for Charlie a little bit later, but uh, so it, it, just this whole circle of friends that we got to meet during that time was, was so magical. We got back to uh, Silver. We got lost on the way back and we always teased our guys because it was the Cherokee boys club and uh, run by the, uh, the Cherokee tribe. A wonderful organization, great transportation company, but they got lost going out of Chicago. So we drove about an hour and a half out of our way. We didn't let them forget that. We were like, you know, you guys are Indians. You're not supposed to get lost. You're supposed to know where you are all the time. <laughs> so we get to the county line and everybody, everybody in the county, um, it seemed like was sitting at the county line. It, it was like midnight or 1 a.m. It was really late. And uh, they even brought the fire truck. Uh, the fire truck at that time. So the fire truck, <laughs> yeah, they brought the only one. So it was, you know, we sort of paraded through downtown and, um, and that was my last day. That was the last day on the job because I started my business and started the very next day with a camp uh, actually fairly close by, but that's kind of my memory of it. Uh, what happened from it is, was extraordinary. And a lot of that's due to, to, uh, um, at that time, MBA or marching bands of America, but Larry McCormick uh, was a real visionary about trying to put things together and put information out there. He was a businessman who was really kind of a drum corps band guy. And so he got this idea of doing this thing called weekend with the experts. So he put top designers, top uh, color guard people, top percussionists together. And we go around the country and do these clinics and it quite honestly paid really, really well. I remember that I worked on putting the clinic together probably for six months. I wrote, I researched, uh, you know, it was coordinated. So if you talked about something, there would be a slide, there would be a videotape. And um, I got Freddie Martin to, uh, he was my, <laughs> and I get this, Freddie was my assistant. <laughs> and uh, basically uh, between the two of us, uh, as slow as we talked, we could fill the time up with as, <laughs> as much as we knew. So it was, it was just a, a lot of fun to do that. Um, I was, um, I also got all kinds of opportunities, uh, to go teach. Uh, I have to tell one quick story if we had time. Um, I was invited, I was home on a Sunday afternoon, uh, in, I guess it was 79, uh, July 4th. And I was going to have two or three days and I didn't even have a, a home. I had just moved everything out and I was storing my stuff. And, um, but my parents had me over for dinner. My mom had fixed my favorite dinner and the phone rings and my dad answered it. And he said, Oh, I think you want the other Mr. Buckner. Well, on the other end of the phone was Jim King. Well, Jim King, at that time was the director of bands at East Texas State University, which is now Texas A&M Commerce. And he said, George Zingali's canceled on the clinic and I would like for you to fill that spot. And I said, well, let me check my calendar. I said, when is it? He said, you start tomorrow morning at eight. <laughs> and of course, I'm in North Carolina. He said, I've already checked the flights. He said, you can be there. Um, and he said, I'll pick you up at the airport. Somehow he talked me into doing it. So I, I went to Texas and of course, Jim picks me up. The other part of the story is, is it, I said, how long does it take us to get from Dallas to commerce? And he reached down the floor and there was a six pack of beer. And he said, when this is gone, we'll be there. <laughs> and seriously, when we were finishing it, we could see the big old Whitley hall, which I know you remember the, the biggest building in East Texas at that time, I guess. That and the water tower. <laughs> So my, but my real claim to fame was there were like eight, 80 band directors, 80 to a hundred band directors in this clinic. And I mean, these were the big time guys cause they had really built this camp into something special a guy named Ed Jones was running the camp. And, but my claim to fame is, is I taught the Texas bands how to stand in a curve line. They had no idea how to chart curvilinear, how to use the drafting tools, all that kind of stuff. 
So I made so many friends down there. I, I wrote a lot in Texas over the years. I finally had to stop writing for bands in Texas because of the state championships. And I was, I was doing, uh, I was actually judging and I didn't want to get in a situation where I was trying to judge and write and that kind of stuff. So not very ethical, but so at any rate, that was one of the crazy things that came of, of, of that. Well, yeah, you, you know, you're, you just kind of had this meteoric rise. I mean, you just zoom right to the top. If, if somebody wanted to get a, a drill written for their marching band, I mean, who do you call? You call Bob Buckner. You, you know, who do you call Ghostbusters, right? No, you call Bob <laughs> Buckner. And, and, uh, and I mean, you, you had it, your drills work. I mean, you made sure the horns were in the right places and, and, uh, you know, you've written for so many and you're still writing. You got any idea how many shows you've written since, uh, since that time back in 1979, 1980? Well, actually I started before that. I started in 1973. My first customer was a man named, uh, who's a very dear friend that died about two weeks ago, Ed Taylor. Ed Taylor was in Clinton, North Carolina. And I, he was the first person I wrote for other than my own band. And he, he had seen my band a contest and he wanted to do that. He said, I have no idea how to do it, but I want you to teach me. So we, for years, we went to Clinton, North Carolina and, and wrote shows and his band was wonderful. He taught 36 years in the same school. He was the only guy. He taught everybody. He taught the beginners. He, he taught. So I could relate to that. So if I start there and, you know, word goes, you know, everything's word of mouth. And the, of course, the, the Vance of America thing is really when the word of mouth really hit. And uh, I, I know it's probably 1,000 to 1,500 shows. Wow. Um, I, I've never tried to keep up with it. I think the most I ever did in one summer was like 72 or something like that. Oh my God. So I know I didn't sleep much. So how's that changed over the years? How's drill writing changed from 1979 to 2020? Well, you know, it used to be in, in 1979, you dealt with the band director and, and usually that worked out pretty well because they, you know, they could, kind of give you basic instructions and how the band marks, how they play, what have you. Now, now you deal with the team and, and in most ways that is far better, but uh, in terms of structuring the program, it's a lot more difficult because you're trying to make more people happy. And when you're writing a show, uh, a, a current show, it's everything is always a compromise. I'm sure they would tell you the same thing on a Broadway musical you know, you just, you can't do everything for everybody. Uh, a lot of, a lot of people that uh, get involved in the activity don't understand the logistics of it. They think that the color guard can be airlifted 84 steps and eight counts. So, you know, you have to deal with that. You have to, and you try to be patient because these are such creative people and a lot of young people who are really excited about it and they're going to be the people there with the product every day. So, I think that's the big thing that's changed. Uh, I think the other thing is, is that I'm much slower now. Um, I used to write by hand. I wrote by hand up until probably 93, 94. I, I would still write, I was writing on Pyware, which I started using about 1982. Um, but uh, a lot of the shows I could still write by hand and I could write more quickly because I always could sort of see things I, I saw it in a musical sense I it was almost like visualizing a score to me and I knew I always thought it would be so wonderful to have a concert where you could you know when the euphoniums have a melody they're on the front of the stage and then suddenly they're back and the clarinets have the melody you know so that's kind of the way I've always approached it I don't know but what happens now is is because uh, power is so much like a video game that it gives you the opportunity to try every possible thing in every possible phrase. And one of the things I learned years ago about drill writing is it's not every phrase needs to be perfect. It needs to be efficient. It needs to be, it needs to work. And I think that's what happens. I think we, uh, it just slows the process down for me because I start writing and I, I start playing. I start, enjoying that process to the point now i don't enjoy sitting in a chair eight to ten to twelve hours a day but i do enjoy the the creative process because you sort of you're constantly now i can play the music constantly 
you know, before I wore out a lot of uh, cassette players, you know, and now you just, you know, you download it on the screen. So I think that's the big thing that's changed. I think it's, uh, it's more complex musically, uh, sometimes to the detriment of entertainment and uh, accessibility. Um, but, you know, that's, that's the way it is. And, and if you're gonna choose to write competitive shows, you, number one, you have to have the chops. You have to know, you know, you know, have to know how to write things that people can claim given the amount of time they have. And I think that's the biggest thing I see that's a problem. A lot of people write shows that there's no way that they're ever gonna have a, even a relative amount of success with, with getting it precise and clean, things mm -hmm. like that. So somewhere along the way, then you, uh, you, you're writing full time. And then all of a sudden the opportunity comes for you to become the, the marching band director at Western Carolina university. So tell us about that transition, uh, in your life and, and how that, how that came about. Well, slightly, there are two parts of that story. Number, number one was that I was at East Tennessee state for four years. Um, and the reason being that I had a friend, um, Richard Compton, who was the, chairman of the music department and they lost their band director in August. So I'm, I'm at home immersed in drill, trying to get all this stuff done. And, um, and he calls and said, I, I need you to help me find a band director. Uh, well, you couldn't find anybody. You could find some people that wanted to do it, but they couldn't do it in 10 days. So he finally calls me back later that day and said, would you come look at it? I'm like, there's no way I could do that. And when I talked with Donna about it, she reminded me that we did have a son starting college that fall and it would be helpful if we could figure out a way to make it work. But so I drove over, looked at it and decided to do it. So I stayed there for four years and I was director of band. So I was, I had a really full play. I was, I was doing everything, jazz band, concert bands. Um, you know, I was teaching tuba lessons. I was uh, teaching techniques courses, which I love doing. And actually, that was sort of the impetus for the rest of my career. Uh, I realized how much I'd missed teaching um, because you can write all the shows you want to, but at the end of the season, I was always depressed. But when I had kids around, when I had students around, it was always a good feeling because they were, they always wanted to know, they're looking forward, what's next? Where do we go from here? So 1991, July 4th, that son who started college when I went to East Tennessee, died suddenly. Had a, uh, a blood clot enter his heart. Um, so it, of course, rocked our family to the, you know, to our core. And about two weeks later, uh, John West, who was the director of bands at uh, uh, Western Carolina, called me and said, would you be interested in doing the athletic band at Western? So, Don and I talked about it and I was like, well, I, I've already signed a contract with East Tennessee and I said, I can't just leave these people. And she said, well, why don't you figure out the, the schedule? So it worked out that Western rehearsed, East Tennessee rehearsed every day, but two days a week in the morning and three days a week in the afternoon. And, or maybe it was the other way around, I can't remember. But at any rate, she figured out that I could do both bands. So, for a semester, I was a, uh, I was a band director at two different universities in two different states with marching band. So I did that for uh, about, well, from August through January, I left uh, over there. Um, now, you have to understand that I had gone to Western Carolina, and one of the things that I always thought about was what the potential was to do a marching band there. Um, either people you know a lot of people had varying degrees of interest in it and at, at sometimes they had had some really good bands at times they were you know there was not a lot of enthusiasm toward it um but i started thinking about some of those great bands that i'd seen you know the troy state band uh, uh the jacksonville state band the the uh you know james madison university westchester um uh, of of that size they were fcs schools or you know the, the not not division one but the championship series but a lot of those bands had taken the idea that they would make this a music education laboratory and so that's that's what i tried to develop i tried to develop 
um, I, what I would do when I started recruiting for Western was to, I would call band directors that I knew in the state and I called in maybe every chip I had. And I said, I want to know who your best kids are and I want to talk to them and I want you to talk to them because if they want to be a band director, I can teach them to be a band director. And that's how it started. So then we started to develop the leadership program. And for me, what leadership does is that allows you to expand your personal time. So if, if you have things that students can, they can handle those responsibilities, then you can do the things that maybe they are not prepared to do or shouldn't be doing. They shouldn't be handling your budget. They shouldn't be doing things like that. But in, in this case, it just worked out so perfectly that you have all these bright, talented students who really want to do this. Um, I don't know how many uh, they have in the leadership team now. When I left Western, we, we usually ran from 90 to 100. And you've actually seen the benefits of that. You've seen that that Tournament of Champions marching band contest is totally run by students. We don't have parents. So everything is done uh, basically by students who take such pride in, in trying to do this thing really well. Well, you know, if you have been a staff coordinator for that band and, you know, taking a 500 piece band to the Rose Bowl parade, uh, taking your 45 piece band to their first football game is not going to be quite the challenge that it might be for me when I did it in, you know, 1966. So that's sort of, um, that's sort of where that comes from. Yeah. That band was amazing. I mean, I remember seeing here in the band at the tournament of champions and, that contest that you held and you mentioned at Western. And I remember seeing the very first time I was there, this massive humanity coming on the field and they just kept coming and they kept coming and coming and they covered the field and then they hit their first note. And my face felt like I was in a car riding at mock speed. I mean, man, my <laughs> just pu pushed me <laughs> right back. And then the show started. I mean, it was simply, uh, I mean, fantastic. So, yeah, Bob, you, you've been around the world. You've been working with bands, serving a clinician, adjudicator, guest conductor. You've been a public school teacher, university director. What's been your favorite part about being a band director all these years? Um, it's, it's actually pretty simple. It's the, the students and, and the colleagues that I've had, the teachers I've worked with, the, the, the people I've gotten to meet. I've met everybody in our activity, you know, through the things with the – Bands of America National Honors Band uh, in the Rose Parade and the All American Bands that Earl Hurry put together. Uh, I, yeah, I've had the opportunity to work with the absolute finest, and these people come to you ready to work as as a team. Um, the the students that people send now to these All Star units are just such terrific people. You know, for people who are worried about our future. Um, they need to realize that these students will take care of us. They, they understand how to make a plan. They understand real leadership. They understand how to work together. And they, and they understand that that togetherness is what brings us success. And so for me uh, to, to have had those students, yeah, I know with the, with the uh, army all American band, you know, rarely uh, in after about two or three years, once we really got it rolling and accepted, um, every kid was an all-state player in their state. Well, not only were they great players, but their band directors had recommended them. They had to do a video interview, that kind of stuff. So you see what kind of students you're getting. But when I look back on all the teaching I've done, some of my best friends um, are people that I've taught. Um, they're either as band directors or as just people in the community. My dentist is my, uh, was in my high school band. Uh, one of our, actually two of the vice chancellors at Western Carolina University were in the Silver Webster band. Um, so to me, you look at people like that and you realize there are people in those positions who can be counted on. They're terrific people, but they also have the kind of integrity and leadership ability to know if they have a weakness somewhere in their program, they know how to find someone who can help them fix that weakness. And uh, I just think that that's been the most remarkable thing for me is, is I just feel so privileged to have had, you know, the students and the colleagues that I've had over the years. 
Well, I don't know if you're anything like me, but you know, I still think I'm 18 years old. And, and uh, when I try to move my body kind of tells me otherwise. And uh, when I look in the mirror, it really tells me otherwise. But you know, if you could go back and look at that, that kid that played bass drum and then converted to tuba and then was in high school and your director said, Hey, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you three years to try to change your mind. What advice would you give that, that young Bob Buckner? Um, I, I think the one thing would be uh, strive for balance. Um, you know, Don and I've been married 39 years and this has been, um, that has been the thing that she's brought to my life. I mean, so many wonderful opportunities that we've had together, but um, just understanding that the importance of the whole, not just the importance of your profession or the importance of um, even your family. You know, some people get so caught up in family that they never, they sort of hide all their talents. So I think it's, you have to learn to balance both. You have to learn where the limits are for both. And, and sometimes one has to give so that the other can succeed and vice versa. And I think if, if I were doing it again, I, early in your career, balance is really probably not that important if you're, um, you know, if you're not married, if you don't have a family, but you learn it quickly when you start to work with band parents because the, the areas that were weakest for me were band literature because there really wasn't any in 1966. You know, if you had a really good band, you played transcriptions <laughs> I mean, or, or you didn't, you know, I mean, that, that was it. But the, the pedagogy was always a challenge, but also the parents. And so one of the things you have to learn in, in terms of balancing your program is that your parents need to be led. They need to have the leadership uh, light on uh, for them. They really are not your enemies. And a lot of times young band directors go out and they, they dread the parent meeting. Well, just prepare for them and say, Hey, we're here to boost this. This is what we need um, here. What are your suggestions? You know, it, just involve them just like you do anybody else. Because if a parent takes the time to come to a meeting, they care about their child. So, you know, try to try to take advantage of that. And I think that would be the, the one word I would say to every young teacher is is find a way to balance things. Don't just get yourself so that you're, you know, you're one dimensional. Yeah. You know, ever since I met you, I think, Bob, you're one of those passionate band directors I've ever met. But your family has always been, uh, you know, paramount in your life. I mean, you always talk so much about your family and you spend a lot of time with them. And, and so I think that's just a, a remarkable thing. And I think you've practiced that pretty darn well throughout your life. And, and I know that every time I have the opportunity to be with you, it makes my life a little bit richer. I have a lot of fun and we laugh a lot. And hopefully we're going to get through this uh, coronavirus and we're going to meet somewhere and maybe bring our golf clubs and play around to golf. How about that? Absolutely. I cannot wait. Matter of fact, as soon as I finish today, I'm going to the golf course. <laughs> well, I am jealous. Bob Buckner, <laughs> thanks so much for being on the podcast, man. I love you, brother. Love you, Charlie. Thank you so much. I don't believe I've ever met a more down-to-earth person than Bob Buckner. Bob is one of those guys who loves band, and he loves teaching, and he loves kids. And he's the poster child for working hard leads to good things. Working hard can lead to great things. And Bob has accomplished a lot of great things in life. Yet he still remains so humble. He's such a wonderful guy. Anybody that's ever had the chance to work with him has come away richer. I can tell you that. Well, that's Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and friends. Next week, we're going to sit down and have a nice long conversation with Paul Lavender, international composer and arranger and Vice President of Instrumental Publications for Hal Leonard. That's Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and friends. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for listening to Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and friends. If you would like to send a question to Charlie or have a comment, please send an email to bandtalkcharlie at gmail.com. We hope you will let your colleagues, students, and friends know about Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and Friends. Thanks for joining us, and we look forward to being with you again soon.